Okay, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I, I really appreciate to see so many people here, some friends and some new, new friends uh, to, for Neatech. And I, I hope you will enjoy the next two days uh, of workshops and, and presentations and, and uh, networking as well, okay? Uh, we're going to start uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, presentation, the first presentation. It will be an introduction by uh, Dr. Carolyn Curtis. Uh, the Vice President for Academic Affairs of uh, Hudson Valley Community College, and uh, she has been an incredible uh, supporter of Neatex uh, from the beginning. So, Dr. Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hudson Valley Community College. We are absolutely delighted to be hosting this uh, most exciting Neatex conference. I would definitely be remiss right off the bat if I didn't mention the incredible job that the Hudson Valley Community College Neotech team, the work that they have done has just been incredible. <laughs> Their work is impeccable, it's important, and it is vibrant. Abe and Ricky and Aaron and so many partners have come together to make a real difference. Two years ago, this team captured $3 million in funding from the National Science Foundation to promote STEM and technical education throughout the Northeast. The overriding goal for Neotech, as you know, is to prepare the technology workforce for the future. And what a difference they have made. Most importantly in the K-12 schools that are working with us to bring STEM topics into their classroom and we are sharing some wonderful resources with each other. We're also grateful to our industry partners for their continued support, Global Foundries, General Electric, Semitech, IBM, Applied Materials, and Tokyo Electronics. I'm certainly looking forward to the keynote speaker today, Dr. Adair, Associate Director of the Penn State Center for Nanomedicine and Materials, along with other prominent voices that will be joining us such as Dr. John King, Jr., the New York State Commissioner of Education. It's definitely going to be an exciting and informative conference. We thank you all for being here and for allowing us to host, and let's have a really good conference. Thank you, everyone. I would like to invite uh, uh, Bob Ehrman from Penn State University uh, uh, to allow him uh, to introduce Dr. Adair. Uh, uh, Bob knows him for a long time and he knows uh, better than anybody else here what type of extraordinary work he's doing at, uh, uh, Dr. Adair is doing at uh, Penn State. So uh, uh, please, Bob, thank, thank you, you very much. Hi, I'm Bob Ehrman. I'm the managing director of the NAC Center at Penn State, and uh, Abe asked me to, uh, 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 gave me the honor to introducing uh, Dr. Adair. Um, Dr. Adair is, uh, is the uh, professor of material science and engineering uh, and bioengineering and pharmacology, lots of words after that one there, uh, at Penn State. Um, he's been there for, since 1998, but he had a previous history before that at, at Penn State. Um, he actually is a Community College graduate uh, from from, um, from Florida, the what was it Palm Beach Junior College actually. So uh, the, he went from junior college there to, unfortunately, the Florida Gators. I'm sorry, <laughs> not a good thing, you know, when you're, you're a football school. Well, we used to be a football. We're still a football school. We're still there. <laughs> we had a nice discussion at dinner about that last night. Um, Dr. Adair uh, graduated with a material science and engineering degree from, from University of Florida. Uh, he's a Fulbright post uh, uh, postdoctoral fel fellow uh, at the University of Western Australia. He actually worked at Battelle also. Uh, he went, he worked, went back to the University of Florida from 1990 to 1997. Uh, he's been a professor of material science and engineering and director of the particulate material since, since, uh, center since uh, 1998 at Penn State. He has over 240 publications, 13 patents, 
um, several copyrights on computer software and such. Uh, he's a member, I'll let you read it in the book, the American Ceramic Society, uh, the, uh, hold, holds a, a fellowship there, uh, and actually American Chemical Society, Materials Research Society, and New York Academy of Sciences. He actually uh, has had, um, he's, he, yeah, uh, sorry, I was going to say that. He received several awards in innovation and teaching while on the faculty at the University of Florida and Penn State. So he is uh, a really uh, good man and uh, excellent scholar. Uh, great to open this conference, I believe. Um, his talk is going to be entitled Nanotechnology, Seeing What's Next, Facts, Fallacies, and Myths. So please welcome Dr. James H. Adair. I'd like to thank Abe Michelin and the other organizers for inviting me. This is uh, about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, I gave a talk at our uh, community college forum down in uh, State College. And so this is, I had the same title actually. So this is an update on where we see things heading in the next five to 15 years or so, particularly with respect to medical applications of nanoscience and technology. I have to, oh, here we go. For full disclosure, uh, one of the ideas that we had I thought was so cool that, um, and I'll touch on that, that Mark Kester and I co-founded uh, Na Keystone Nano Incorporated, a corporation that's dedicated to the notion that nanoscience is going to transform cancer treatment. And oddly enough, I always ask this question, how many people have been touched by cancer? You know someone, you've had it, you're a survivor. If you don't mind, how many survivors do we have? I'm a survivor too. It's a, it's a nice club to be in. You, you don't want to join, but you don't want to get kicked out either. <laughs> so, so we're dedicated to the notion that cancer treatment um, can be vastly improved and made much more benign and more efficacious for the patient. This is my um, immediate crew of graduate students, undergraduate students. Danny Pfeffer was, is at, was actually a high school student at the time working in, in my lab. For some reason, she decided to go to Harvard on a full ride instead of staying around State College. Uh, but the rest of the crew work in various aspects of nanoscience uh, dedicated toward, mostly toward human health care. I also have, as part of Penn State Center for Nanomedicine and Materials, we have a very large body of faculty in this translational medical area. This is just a small cross-section uh, of these individuals. Uh, <clears throat> early on, I began work with my best friend and colleague, Peter Eklund. We were both diagnosed with cancer about the same time, and unfortunately, Peter did not survive. Uh, but much of his biophotonic contributions are still being carried forward. And this effort goes all the way through to the clinical side with Randy Halleck, who's a clinician, surgeon, uh, Gail Matters, who, who works in the College of Medicine and Gastroenterology, Jill Smith, who's now Emeritus Professor of, Med of Medicine, and is now one of the directors at the National Cancer Institute, and Tom Lochran, who's an expert in acute myeloid leukemia at, at Penn State's Cancer Institute. So we all know that nanoscience is going to touch us in many ways. Uh, both with respect to energy, I'll touch on electronics and photonics, just a, well, a bit of a snippet, security, but also human health care. And I say human health care because I think it's important to keep our focus on human health care. There's basic science and there's clinical science. 
Our effort is somewhere in between in that we work within boundary conditions associated with human he health care, and we work with animal systems that f foster a better understanding and implementation of nanoscience into human health care, particularly cancer. And I, don't, I didn't have quite the uh, forest fire in the belly when I embarked in this area about 2003. I had, uh, just as a quick aside, I, I uh, started at Penn State in 98. My family has a little genetic quirk in that if we get one particular cold virus, it will damage our heart. And it's a cold virus, a common adenovirus. And in 1998, I started slowing down, and sure enough, I had an enlarged heart. I was admitted to Hershey, um, uh, to uh, the State College Hospital, and overnight, they had decided, okay, time to life flight, so I got a helicopter ride. That was exciting. But what was even better was that it was Joe Paterno's 300th win that day. And, and you know, no one figured I was going to survive, including myself, so I figured, eh, what the hell. I asked the helicopter pilot to go over the stadium. <laughs> so I got to see all the crowds in Beaver Stadium. And yes, I'm not only a Florida Gator, I'm a big Penn State fan as well, in spite of our current travails. Well, size matters, and most of the things that we talk about in nanoscience are kind of down here in the 100 nanometer or below range. But in the implementation of nanoscience, we really are dealing with a hierarchical sort of effect. For example, in the case of our bioimaging and drug delivery systems, these are truly nanoparticulates down in the 20 nanometer range, up to maybe 40 or 50 nanometers. But in the case of the, keep pulling that out, in the case of surgical instruments, very fine surgical instruments, which we see as the future, to, to less invasively uh, operate on patients with cancer. We start with very fine particles down in the nanoscale, but we assemble them into larger structures, submillimeter, but larger structures. And we do this in a very directed way. Now, part of our philosophy can be found <clears throat> in this uh, statement by Feynman. Uh, the worthwhile problems are the ones you really solve or help solve. And, and really, Feynman was a um, brilliant man, of course. No problem is really too small if, if, it, if you can really do something about it, if you can fix something. Well, I was asked, what's the most important thing in nanoparticulates in 2003? I rather singly minded said dispersion 10 times. What are the 10 most important things? Dispersion, manipulating nanoparticles at the nanoscale. That's the most important thing. I'm here to say today, dispersion is no longer the most important thing. We've figured it out. We know how to process from an engineering viewpoint large amounts of nanoparticulates. And we're ready to move on to bigger and better things. And of course, it, as Bob said, I got my BS in chemistry, and I actually went into material science because of the attraction in colloidal and interfacial chemistry. Every material scientist that I know is really a specialist in some subset of material science and, in, and engineering. I'm a colloid interfacial chemistry guy, which means I study very fine particles and always have. Uh, I minored in zoology because I aspired to medical school, but it turned out I really wasn't interested in medical school. I, I, once I started graduate school in colloid and interfacial chemistry, I, I told them that I don't want to go to medical school. So we're, for the last 40 years, wow, 40 years, we've been working in this regime. We can take powders, and we can beautifully characterize powders. We have lots of equations and tons of sophisticated equipment, and I can tell you the size, the shape, the, 
uh, three-dimensional nature, even down to the nanoscale. When it comes to materials, I can break things. I can determine the electronic and optical transport properties. I can determine the structure, the substructure, the atomic scale structure. But in going from a powder to a bulk material, this is taking a, uh, some exception with Sidney Harris, this is where a miracle occurs. And that's where we need to be more explicit. And that's what my career has been dedicated to, along with a lot of other people like myself. So let's take a look at, at an area that we're all fairly comfortable, comfortable with, electronic and photonic applications. Clearly, increased miniaturization has occurred throughout uh, my lifetime. Shoot, I remember when the transistor was invented, even though I didn't know the, the consequences. The actual consequences were, were I got a little transistor radio about 1959 that was smaller than a pack of cigarettes, made in Japan. That was one of the first transistor radios. It got like three stations. Uh, but it, it was a lot easier than carrying that clunker with the battery to the beach. Just kidding, we didn't do that. We just hung out and talked at the beach before radio came. You can produce unique materials, as I'll touch on, as well as unique applications. And at, at the University of Florida in the 90s, we began working on colloidal diamond. I was interested in diamond from several fundamental viewpoints. One is that, wow, this could be the perfect colloid to actually study because we don't have to worry about solubility with diamond. It doesn't dissolve in water. But you can't get perfectly, perfect spheres of diamond either. They always have some fastening. But we got involved with utilizing diamond nuclei and creating patterns using photolithographic processes, really two-dimensional uh, pattern deposition. This is a, a diamond film. What's interesting about this is there's no etching associated with this. We got diamond growth wherever we put our colloidal particles. Now these were about 200 nanometer diamond nuclei followed by a chemical vapor uh, deposition process. But we found that when we deposited about 20 nanometer diamond, we could get very the same by intent, this is the same magnification, we could, we could get very nicely refined features. And if you look at this right hand side, some of you probably recognize it, uh, this is, is part of the pad of a diamond diode. And if you step back a little further, you see this pad is part of an array of diamond diodes. So this is utilizing colloidal chemistry combined with conventional CVD to nucleate and grow diamond. This was a five layer patterning process to get the, the, these array of diamond diodes. One of the, the great myths in the ceramic community has always been yeah, synthetic approaches for sufficient quantities of affordable nanoparticulates just don't exist. Well, that's absolute nonsense. Colloidal silica, among other nanoparticles, have, have been made for 175 years. No doubt the, the paper that the, the program's written on has colloidal silica in it. Why? Because it helps retain the smaller fragments of cellulose during the paper making process. So, so colloidal silica is there. Colloidal silica is often added in food to control texture. Uh, it gives you a very smooth texture. Uh, from a historical perspective, the catalytic materials, ceramics, metal inks, et cetera, are, are colloidal materials that are in the sub-100 nanometer that made it large quantity. So large quantities of, of nanostructure materials are, are readily available uh, and can be dispersed. So can, with these large quantities, even though they're agglomerated, can we mill them? Now the paradigm in my field, ceramic science and engineering, is that ceramic particles are brittle when we mill them. Milling, I mean, probably the least attractive of all uh, processes. But, it, but it, it's at the center of most powder processing. Uh, 
the idea is you have defects in these brittle materials, and just as if I had a ceramic mug here and dropped it even on this wooden floor, it'd probably break. There's some defects in it. You get a stress intensity at those defects, and it goes ping and breaks. The idea with, with milling ceramics, though, was brittle fracture promotes particle fracture. However, you can't mill below half a micron because you've eliminated all the defects. Well, this is, again, a fallacious argument. Nanograin polycrystalline agglomerates, which most ceramics uh, are composed of through the calcination and heat treatment process, the primary defects are actually the grain boundaries, and I'll show you some consequences of this. So milling can literally achieve primary particle size, and we routinely mill down to 20 nanometer in very concentrated suspensions in my laboratory it, using an attrition mill. I like attrition mills as, from a scientific viewpoint because I can continuously draw out sample, and this particular patent was based on controlling pH explicitly during the milling process. So you continuously draw out sample, and you continuously feed sample back into this attrition mill. This is also called a mixed media mill. And the actual milling takes place in between these small beads, and, and you get a very high shear uh, between the particles, and it's actually the particle-particle interactions, which I find attractive as a colloid chemist, because that's what we study, that lead to, to the milling. But, but why should I be able to mill a polycrystalline aggregate? Well, that's because grain boundaries are weaker than the bulk materials. And if you have a calcined polycrystalline aggregate, you, you can unzip along the grain boundaries, but the pH control comes in because if you don't terminate, and these are usually some kind of metal oxygen linkage with protons, in other words, maintain a, a weakly acidic state at all times with your pH stat approach, you can terminate and literally unzip particles to primary particle size. The primary particle size is 20 nanometers, you can go to 20 nanometers. If the primary particle size is 200, you go to 200 nanometers. So we don't look at milling as a milling process where we're trying to cleave single crystals. We look at milling as a deaggregation process. The grain boundaries are the weak link, and you can make very large quantities, uh, kilogram quantities, just in my little laboratory attrition mill. Uh, in very short times, out an hour, say. Now I want to turn to, to two sort of case studies in specific areas. When I was diagnosed with cancer, and God help me, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer the year before I was diagnosed with colon cancer. Believe you me, colon cancer is much, much less romantic than breast cancer. Uh, I sat on my cancer literally. My wife, on the other hand, Seeing her go through her cancer treatment, I would rather go through chemo a thousand times and see her go through one more time. It, it was very difficult for me uh, to see my wife go through her cancer treatment. And Bernadette is a very tough individual, believe me. But um, there are two ways that we deal with cancer treatment. Surgical intervention, of course, hack out the, the material, and the second way is drug delivery. And that, that's going to be my focus. Now, along with drug delivery, there, there is absolutely no doubt that the, the single most critical step in cancer care is early detection. Late detection is not a good thing. I was stage three, so I'm four and a half years out. I had a 20% chance of survival with stage three colon cancer, and I'm at four and a half years. I still get a little sweaty palms thinking about that, but I'm still here. So let's put on our engineering hat. I want to make a surgical instrument, but I want to make a very small surgical instrument, and I want to make a lot of surgical instruments that can be on the end of a flexible endoscope or interfaced with a robotic surgical sense system like the da Vinci system, which more or less uses surgical instruments 
that if, if you looked at the surgical instruments used in the Civil War, that's pretty much the design of most of the surgical instruments. Haven't changed a great deal. They've been, certainly there have been improvements in uh, quality of the mostly metals used. There's been uh, tremendous advance, advances in the use of sterile instruments combined with anesthetic since the Civil War era. But the surgical instruments themselves have not changed very much. So in terms of material selection for mesoscale, very fine surgical instruments, we need biocompatibility. If you're doing hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of surgical procedures for, say, colon cancer a year, you're going to lose an instrument. And you don't know where it's going to wind up. It's got to be a biocompatible material. This means non-toxic alloys and ceramics. More on this in a few minutes when we begin selecting materials for drug delivery and bioimaging. You need high strength because you're making very small devices. We designed for 600 megapascals with a ceramic bend strength of 2.4. We're actually achieving that high of a bend strength. This is about 300,000 PSI. You need a high elastic modulus, no hinges. You use compliant mechanisms. So you don't have to build hinges in the submillimeter range. The instrument needs to be damage toler tolerant, able to take mechanical stresses, high strength gives low failure probability. And then the critical step, and the one that has been on our wish list in powder processing for five decades, is to marry design, finite element design for structural materials to the microfabrication. And that's precisely what we've done, working with Mary Frecker and uh, George Lassert at Penn State. And then a critical step is also that moves beyond what we academics usually think about. You want reliable manuf manufacture, large quantities and reliable properties in a batch-to-batch -batch basis. So this is the process. It took us about four years to develop this, and now we can prototype almost any kind of shape in six to eight months. So the first iteration, of course, I controlled because we're, this was the basic process to measure part, uh, using part yield and strength uh, as our criteria for the very simple shapes. And this is a, a very simple shape. This is a little bin bar. If you look closely, this bin bar is 370 microns by 15 by 20 microns in cross section. And so we went through this iterative process. We went through four generations with process improvement at each step. We started at about 900 megapascal bin strength, and today we're at 2.4 megapascal bin strength. We make a bat, one of the remarkable features of the process is we have very, very large aspect ratios of 40 to 1. We can make 10,000 parts per 10 by 10 centimeter substrate. We've married the very large scale integration inherent to semiconductor processing to particle science and manipulation. And so as we come out or into our iterative process, we begin to interface with our design team. That's Mary Frecker and George Lassert. They're experts at calculational material properties. This is one of the models that, that Mary uh, prepared in the ceramic system. This is designed to, to operate at about 600 megapascals. That's the maximum principal stress that this kind of surgical instrument will experience uh, from the widest opening to the tightest retraction. Mary also builds multifunctionality. I can't really show that very well in a graphic, but a, a rectangular Teflon sheath fixes over the, the back end, the distal end of the surgical instrument. It's rectangular because if you, if you retra retract and extend the sheath, it causes these tips to pinch down and grasp. But with the rectangular shape and the hot, very high strength of these materials, if you twist the sheath, it's a cutting instrument. 
And so part of the strategy is to build multifunctionality into each of these instruments. Another thing that I'm very excited about, this is, is Mary's CAD CAM file uh, that, that shows the optimum topology surgical instrument. We utilize that in my group to create the photo mass. So it's a wholly digital process up to the point where we create the photo mass. And we have to take into account the kind of shrinkage that either the metal or the ceramic is going to undergo during processing. Another innovation was we're making little tiny parts that we want to handle them. No, we leave them on a refractory substrate and they go through the process without being touched until the very end when it's time to pick them up and assemble them into the end of a flexible endoscope. And then the other exciting bit is we can make a lot of parts using this photolithographic process. Now, one of the issues that we had was how are we going to fill the moles? And this was, you know, we, we, we had a large translational team from uh, the physicists, the chemists, material scientists, uh, the mechanical engineers, the industrial and system engineers, the surgeon. And a after a couple meetings, things like, well, we're going to use microtubules to inject in. And I, I rejected all of them because none of them would guarantee that we're getting good and uniform mold filling of these pastes that we make. And I get, you know, it's kind of funny how you get into these boring faculty meetings and the mind wanders. And I was sitting there, Nicky Antolino, my PhD student at the time, he's now over at Schenectady at General Electric Central Research Lab. Nick was wearing a Penn State shirt. I was looking at it and I was thinking, huh, it's kind of, it's screen printed. And it came to me. You don't, you don't try to inject each mole, you squeegee it in with screen printing process. But you don't use a screen because we know the resolution in screen printing is what? 15 to 25 microns. That's the edge resolution. You use the mole cavity as the screen. And that's what we do. So, so it's amenable, you can use a regular screen printer, but the mold itself is the screen. We don't use screens. And that's how we get such precise, as I'll show you, shapes. And our typical yields are 90% now. So we, if we have 10,000 parts, we'll get at least 90%. And the other thing with the, with the refractory substrates, I went to John Rigby at Kyocera. He's president, was president of Kyocera Ceramics. Now he's the international president. I said, hey, John, can I get some substrates that you use for integrated circuits? They're high alumina. And John goes, not a problem, sent me a batch of his high alumina substrates, and that's what we use as our substrates. All readily available materials. So this gives you some idea of, of some of the things that we've manufactured. We make these little rectangular shapes so we can look at the uh, end resolution. It's about 2.2 microns with the conventional photolithography that we utilize. The particles we use are 65 nanometers zirconia, which are completely dispersed using our chemically ad milling approach. We, we stole a bunch of stuff from semiconductor folks. To, make a, to, to evaluate parts, we use optical scatterometry, but with a 20x objective uh, instead of the typical 1x. To, to make these, if, if you came to me and said, hey, Jim, I want you to make me a three inch gear out of zirconia, I'd say, wow, that's, that's not going to be easy. We're going to have to go through a lot of uh, very special processing. We are able to, to make these near net shapes uh, very precisely because one of the issues with a shape like this starts at the burnout stage. Well, we use a reactive ion etching, almost a cold process, to eliminate the organics that are used to make this kind of shape. And we make these, these various arrays, this being the forcep instrument, which has been tested by our colleagues down at Hershey. This has about a 40 to 1 aspect ratio and a freestanding, very fine part that's unusual. We're able to, to get very nice teeth at the grasping end and at the butt end. In this case, two of these would go together and then fit in with the sheath. 
Uh, it almost looks like a cartoon, uh, it looks so clean. Oh, and the edge resolution is one grain in the polycrystalline material of about 500 nanometers. So what's our vision? Well, 1882, patients were filleted open uh, just for gallbladder uh, with the chance of sepsis, uh, shock, uh, anesthesia was in its infancy in 1882, and the basic surgical instruments were World War or Civil War type of instruments. By 1987, multiple and single incision surgery were, were being done with the uh, uh, endoscope, not a flexible endoscope, but an endoscope. You had various uh, holes that were put into the patient. Uh, the, the major issue with this kind of approach was there's only one surgical instrument on the end of the endoscope. Uh, at each uh, step of the operation, these are retracted on a long wire and thrown away, and then another instrument put in. Uh, about 37% of the operating time is spent changing instruments. Our vision is incisionless robotic surgery this is being, this is in clinical trials around the United States, this kind of concept. You go in through the oral cavity and the stomach if you're taking out the gallbladder, appendix, et cetera. So there, it's zero to one day hospital stay. There's minimal pain because there are no pain receptors in the stomach. No muscle damage to the abdominal wall that conventional appendectomies can lead to. No scars less chance of infection, and it's significantly less expensive. So that's where we're heading in that case. But I want to step back a little bit and talk about healthcare as a, a worldwide effort. When we think of, when I, when I got my cancer diagnosis, my wife and I had already thoroughly discussed it. They were taking two weeks to get back to me, found two polyps in my routine colonoscopy. So. I was ready for the diagnosis. Well, of course, I immediately went down to Hershey and forgot my wallet and all my personal uh, uh, identification. They had to take my word for it that I was who I was. Luckily, I know a lot of people there. So I wasn't quite as cool as I thought I was. But I had every expectation that the clinic and the, that I w was going into looked like this that I would have well-trained personnel looking at me at every level in the examination room. And the surgery a week later, I had no doubt that I would have equally sophisticated things going on. And of course, in the developed world, we're, we're talking mostly about things like cancer and heart disease being treated. But in the developing world, this is a typical clinic. The, the developed world has neither the sophisticated facilities nor the well-trained personnel to deliver sophisticated health care. So you, if you need sophisticated, sophisticated tests, they need to be low cost. And one of the solutions, of course, is miniaturization and kits, simple kits. And of course, yes, there is cancer throughout the third world. In fact, uh, the, the number of patients who die annually from cancer is around 7 million per year. Uh, but there, there are HIV AIDS, particularly throughout the sub saharan region of Africa. Malaria and hepatitis are endemic and, and mostly treatable, not all treatable. Hep C, it can be held at bay, but treatment at, is difficult. This shows the world incidence of malaria and the distribution by color from 1900 to 2002. In the post-World War II area, 44 developed countries got together and said, hey, let's eradicate malaria. My own father was stationed in the Philippines at the end of World War II. He got, he, he got malaria, and for the next 30 years, about every three or four years, uh, he would go to bed and shake and shiver for a week or so and get past that episode and get back and go to work. He, he never really talked about it because most of those guys didn't talk about it. 
uh, when the vaccine came, he was one of the first people in line. He got the vaccine, so the last 15 years of his life, he at least did not have to worry about malaria. If you look at this map, you can see in 1900, malaria extended as far north as Boston in North America. And now, since 1945, it's more or less eradicated from North America. But within South America and Central America, the sub-Saharan uh, sub uh, areas of Africa, the jungle areas of East Asia, there's still large numbers of malaria. And they, the, the mosquito that carries it, uh, it is largely resistant to DDT, the number one. Uh, DDT is not, of course we eliminated it in the United States, but it's still used throughout the world. So, so this is a pervasive problem and care mostly deals with getting care to the patient. So how can we do that? Well, in 2001, <clears throat> this was one of the first uh, proposals for lab on a chip where you marry semiconducting processing to optics, miniature photonics, and uh, microfluidics, take, think blood, and separating out blood cells as well as blood plasma, uh, the idea being you could put a drop of blood on this and you could evaluate for things. Like, does the patient have malaria? Does the patient have the HIV antibody? Just this past, I think this came out in November, uh, Hosan Nabam, Balam et al. proposed a new way to think about photonic nanocrystal sensors with an infiltrating fluid. Here's the waveguide, but there's a gradient of the photonic nanocrystals such that you're quite literally slowing down the speed of light, which gives you, as I'll show, much more precise and sensitive uh, chemical analyses. And these sort of photonic crystals can be miniaturized such that they will be on a chip. Think about it this way. You have a spectrophotometer now that makes up one of these uh, diodes. And it's all miniaturized, and it's designed to detect markers for malaria, various markers for hepatitis, and the HIV antibody. So <clears throat> this is more or less a conventional um, sensor. This is their, what they call the slow biosensor from this paper. Uh, this is the transmission spectrum for a test system. This is what you're trying to detect. Uh, and this is what you detect with this modified slow biosensor. And this just came out. It's not being tested. It's not even, it's moving, I'm sure, toward clinical trial. But you get much, much greater sensitivity uh, by relatively straightforward but incredibly clever uh, modification to these kinds of sensors. And when you look at spectroscopy techniques for diagnosis and research of human disease, we have magnetic resonance spectroscopy, diffuse correlation, Raman, of course, near-infrared spectroscopy, fluorescent and laser-induced fluorescent spectroscopy. And these are actually being used for specific materials. NIRS uh, will evaluate renal oxygenation in children with heart disease. Uh, the, uh, and that was uh, developed by 2011, fairly recently. I'm going to talk about near-infrared spectroscopy from another perspective, and this is diagnostics and chemotherapy. And this is packaged, and, th and this is what Keystone Nano is commercializing. This is packaged within a calcium phosphosilicate particle in which we can attach a lot of different things, including the target molecules for cancer, such as pancreatic cancer, uh, various kinds of, of breast cancer, acute myeloid leukemia. We don't need to treat solid cancers. These are truly hunter-killer particles in the Tom Clancy sense of the word. 
Now, this is the only near infrared uh, that I'm going to show, but we have evaluated the dispersion of the near infrared light as a function of tissue thickness. This is in porcine muscle tissue. You know, Penn State was founded a, as a land grant university and as agricultural college, and, and that agricultural roots, we can go to the meat lab and they will give you any cut of meat you're willing to pay for for research. So we went to the meat lab. They, they slaughtered the hogs on Tuesday. The meat's available Thursday morning. Believe me, the meat that you get from the grocery store is not that fresh. Um, and they, they slice it very precisely to our specification, and we determine the light transmission as a function of thickness. And we measure the absorptivity of various wavelengths. And the near infrared, the endosan green in particular, uh, transmits through human, well, porcine tissue. I hope I don't offend anyone, but we're pretty close. Our muscle is pretty close to porcine muscle. Think pork loin. Uh, and, and so we're, we're able to get the basic photonics, and we, we can see it's at 785 to 850 in, with just a click, uh, no real time lapse photography, down to about six centimeters. That's pretty thick. For you ladies, think of, and instead of going for your uh, mammogram, you will have five or 10 years, You'll go to your primary care physician. They will scan your breast with a handheld near infrared sensor and let you know if you have a hot spot. You got a hot spot? Go to the MRI. Go to the CT scan for more sophisticated scanning. And hopefully it'll be a pulse positive, but if it's an actual tumor, they'll be able to stage it at that point. They'll be able to very precisely tell where it is. And with our endosan and grain, they can, the particles will, will be in the tumor. The endosan and green itself is chemotherapeutic. So we use very low uh, intensity light to produce the fluorescence from the endosan and green. But if we up the intensity by a factor of about 1,000, still very low levels, it becomes chemotherapeutic. So you, you, you can go through that and you can monitor it with MRI much less invasive and benign. Now, there are engineering criteria for nanoscale delivery systems, and these are some of them. And some of them you'll say, that's obvious. Yes, it is. But, the, but, but this is a, a big area, and not everyone thinks about things like not having, you need non-toxic materials and degradation products. You need small size. You need small size because when you're injected with nanoparticulates, if you're greater than about 200 nanometers, your immune system goes up, form body, alert, 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 and shifts the particles into the liver where they are metabolized. You really need encapsulation rather than surface decoration. If I decorate a nanoparticle with, say, docotaxel, that's a, a widely uh, well, that's the most widely used chemotherapeutic in the world today. Docotaxel is going to degrade from the IV site until it gets to the actual tumor. Furthermore, the patient's going to have all the side effects that you have, and they're quite egregious. Docotaxel causes hair loss. It's the most widely used breast cancer therapeutic. Um, and, you know, when I was going through cancer, did I care about my hair? Not since I was 29. <laughs> Did my wife care? Yes. And every, every lady that I've ever talked to felt the worst point for the docodaxel treatment was when within about 15 minutes, all the hair on their body fell off. And they manage it different ways. You gals are very strong, but you, it's, that was tough to see all the hair. Me, I cut my hair because I didn't really care. I haven't cared about hair since 29. If you don't encapsulate, you still have all the same side effects. It's just a way to transport, and it's not very efficacious. A biggie for me is you need to have colloidal stability in physiological conditions. If your particles on injection agglomerate into 200 nanometer plus, 
Well, then they, the liver takes them right out of the body, and it's not an efficacious delivery system. Something most people don't think about. If you're delivering an a encapsulated chemotherapeutic, you want that to get out of the body. So you need a clearance mechanism. And folks, we have four ways, and that's it, that we clear. You can clear through excretion, urination, perspiration, or exhalation. Now, exhalation is a bad. You don't want particulate coming out of your lungs because they're not going to leave the lungs. They're going to stick. Perspiration is something every chemotherapeutic patient knows about. During my wife's chemotherapy, I, I handled her sheets with rubber gloves and tongs because you lay in bed, you perspire, and in that perspiration are high levels of the chemotherapeutic which, by the way, are pretty toxic, just in and of, of themselves. When I went through my chemo, same thing. My wife handled my sheets and bedclothes with tongs because you can get exposed to high levels of the chemotherapeutic by, through your hands. So you need a clearance mechanism. All of the, all the above is great unless you have a clearance mechanism. Our particles go out through the animal feces. Any particles that don't find a tumor are excreted. And I keep telling my graduate students, be happy, because when we really get down into the weeds of the biodistribution, it's much, much easier to handle mouse feces than it is to handle mouse urine, because we will do assays on how many of our particles are actually in the feces of the animal. They don't seem to appreciate that. You need long clearance times. You need long circulation times. So about every 40 minutes or so, every last drop of our blood goes through our kidneys and our liver. Th these are the organs that take the toxins out of our, out of our blood. So if, if you think about it, particularly the kidney, you've got these uh, about a million nephrons in each kidney and you have a semi-permeable membrane. So all the blood gets filtered, including the particles, because you have a capillary bed that prevents any particulates if they don't get taken up into the kidney. And then the particles have to get reabsorbed down in the proximal tubule of the kidney to be put back into the bloodstream. If the kidney sequesters, well, then the, the, the uh, particles go out in the urine. So our particles, they're calcium and phosphate, the body needs them. We see at least 96 hours of presence in tumors. You need a release, if it's encapsulated, you need a intrinsically controlled release mechanism. And then finally, you want to target, once the patient is diagnosed with a particular cancer, you want to be able to target that cancer with the particles. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the issues with the triple negative breast cancer. There's no target that's been found for that. We know there's HER2 and, we can, and the Herceptin chemotherapeutic is a targeted chemotherapeutic for sustained uh, release in the patient. Uh, and, and so that kind of cancer can be targeted. But if we don't know the target, we need to find a target. So that's sort of an engineer's viewpoint. What we want is targeted delivery of encapsulated therapeutics to the desired tissue, low systemic toxicity, high localized concentration, and toxicity. So think what nanoscience and technology promises in chemotherapeutic is much lower concentrations, almost like just simple injection. I, I often was infused for up to 12 hours, and I did that 12 times. 12 hours, there's only so much you can do, and daytime TV is just not worth watching. Mostly I wrote proposals and read papers by my students. Now, let's talk about toxo toxicology quickly. Steve Stern is the head of the tox screening group at the uh, nano characterization lab that's part of our NCI. This lab was founded to be an objective body to look over a wide variety of different nanotechnologies. Steve and his crew have looked at, at about 70 different types of materials and over 240 nanotechnology strategies over the last six years. And I guess surprisingly, 
They see, they use, these are uh, Madden Darby, no, I'm sorry, these are human uh, kidney uh, cells. So they're sensitive cells. 24 hour exposure, what Steve sees with this kind of uh, fluorescent screening is lysosomal activity. And that means that there's an immune response, a cellular immune response to, in this case, quantum dots. Yep, quantum dots with a PEG coating. Uh, and, and quantum dots, it's been widely reported they're toxic, and they are. They're cadmium, selenium, uh, zinc sulfide, which wants to be zinc phosphate in physiological environment. So th this immune response is called autophagy. You'd think everyone knew about it, but the fact is this was only identified relatively few years ago. Uh, also, some, of, some materials near and dear to my heart, titanium oxide, zinc oxide, fullerenes, fullerenols, quantum dots, rare earth oxides, carbon black and carbon nanotubes, among others, uh, are all found to induce autophagy in this kid, human kidney cell line. Surprisingly, perhaps not so much, iron oxides, our body's full of iron, of course, it's in our blood, not as necessarily a particle, but the body has metabolic pathways to handle iron oxide, calcium phosphate, think bone. Every ma mammalian cell has calcium and phosphate present. More surprising, silica and gold look like they're more or less kind of inert. Uh, Uli Wiesner at Cornell, just I guess down the road here, has developed beautiful fluorescent silica particles, the Cornell dot, that look very efficacious. And right now, gold with surface decoration is kind of the gold standard by many groups. So our vision was always, and this was 2005, irony. I gave stomach cancer because I had a friend who had just survived. I should have had it down here in the colon. I, then it would have been more accurate. Maybe I should change that next time I give a talk. But the basic idea is that we have the whole lock and key unique receptor and targeting sites in order to treat the inoperable as I said. So why calcium phosphate? Well, the solubility of the calcium phosphates increases at low pH. The uh, Ains and Posner and, and their colleagues showed at Columbia in 1965 a Nature paper that when you precipitate calcium and phosphate, you get an amorphous calcium phosphate that will slowly crystallize to the hydroxyapatite, of which one of the purer forms is our teeth or the enamel on our teeth. So re remember this. We found that we had a little bit of silicate. We can suppress the ace amorphous material because if we're going to encapsulate, we want it to be amorphous. Try to start stuffing things into a crystalline materials, you don't get very far. The, the, the crystalline material doesn't is crystalline because of the well-organized ions that, of which it is composed. This is a picture from another paper by uh, Ains and crew in which they did a TM study. You see the lathe-like hydroxyapatite forming from the gray amorphous calcium phosphate. With the silicate present, we do up to 10 atomic percent substitution. This is the endocyanin green particles. We have formulations that have literally been sitting on shelves for about seven years now. This is endocyanin green, amrotavagotin, Tabakovich is just finishing up her uh, PhD on the docotaxel. These, are, as you can see, are, are almost monosized at about 200 nanometers. In terms of colloidal stability, our formulations are very stable at 37 degrees for at least two weeks. That was always an issue with the polymeric and liposomal. So what's the trigger for the calcium phosphate? When they undergo endocytosis, and they readily undergo endocytosis, the pH associated with these particles is the extracellular pH of about 7.4, but the endosomes themselves are designed to drop in pH where the enzymes from the endoplasmic reticulum in the cell, it's not shown in this figure, are transported, and are, the, endosome, the late stage endosome is basically the recycling center of the body. Uh, uh, nucleic acid is broken down into the constituent, constituent nucleotides. 
uh, proteins are broken down into amino acids and then they're reassembled out in the cytosol. But very shortly after undergoing endocytosis, the calcium phosphate dissolves. This causes a high uh, osmolarity uh, and a high osmolarity pressure within the endosome. It breaks open and releases into the cytosol. And with our particles, we can make the insoluble, that's ceramide, soluble. This is some early work that we did. This is on melanoma. The DAPI shows where all of the nuclei are. I'm not sure in this light if you can see this, but each of the cells is ringed by red, which is the rhodamine WT. And when we deliver ceramide with the rhodamine WT and the DAPI, first of all, almost all the cells are dead. The melanoma kind of ugly cancer, as you know. It's like bat wings. These are, cells are dying. They're on their way to their own mortality. Now let's look at the infrared. If, if you look at light, and, and Tim Russin, the physics student, last physics students with, with Peter Eklund, did a very simple thing that physicists are wont to do. Took a blue LED, eh, no light, right? It scatters, absorbs, you don't get any light through, blue light through. Green, you're starting to see, uh, you're right about in here at green, blue's up here. Uh, you're starting to see some light through the, the uh, the fingernail. Red light, you're seeing the first joint. This is actually a relatively low powered near infrared at 785. It literally glows. Tremendous amounts of near infrared light can be transmitted. And then that's been proposed with this so called therapeutic window. With the Inosan and Grain, we actually do our imaging around 830 to 850 nanometer. And in one of our first reports, we showed that the tail vein injected mice, th this is a con negative control, this is a positive control with endosan green. This is a citrate functionalized particle. Citrate's not very effective as a dispersant. This is polyethylene glycol. And at 48 hours, you can see the heart, where you have a large pool of blood, the feces, and you can see the two tumors are beginning to resolve themselves, such that at 98 hours, the animal is still excreting near-infrared particles, so you have an accumulation in the, uh, what's essentially the large intestine, but you can clearly see the tumors in the animal. Furthermore, at much shorter times, we tracked the near-infrared particles, and we saw that they under, that their taken up by any excess particles are taken up by the liver, moved through the hepatobiliary duct, and are dumped into the small intestine and carried out through the feces. So we, we could use our near-infrared particles to literally diagnose. Now this is a little different model. This is an injected human pancreatic cancer. The other model was human breast cancer. This is with the PEG, which look great for the breast cancer, not so much for the pancreas, and this is with targeted delivery with a, a molecule called gastrin-10 for which human pancreatic uh, uh, cells have, are overexpressed the receptor for gastrin. And we're literally lighting up the pancreas. But it gets a little better even. Photodynamic therapy is a treatment that's been around about 45 years. The basic idea is you, you can topically apply a, a porphyrin material that under near-infrared light will break down, become chemotherapeutic locally. Uh, the, the problem is red light has a penetration depth of 50 to 100 microns. These things are de designed to operate at 690 nanometers. You cannot inject the patient uh, systemically because then their whole body is photosensitive and they have to stay in the dark for a month. Well, that patient compliant, if you have cancer, you're very compliant, I certainly was, but I don't know if I could take staying in the dark for 30 days. Uh, the other problem is, the idea is maybe you're getting reactive oxygen. Actually, we, don't, we see that, but that's a secondary effect. And it, there's really not that much dissolved oxygen in cells, so you get depletion. And, it, and it's not a tremendously effective treatment. It is treated to treat bladder cancer, throat cancer, uh, 
and certain forms of skin lesions. What we have found, I just have this one slide, when we look at the relative tumor volume as a function of time, and this is with one IV, which we're designating at day zero, and these are breast, both breast cancer. This is breast cancer in, in a mouse, and this is uh, human breast cancer in an athymic mouse that has a compromised immune system, so the animals don't reject hu human tissue. If you look at all the controls, this is rather typical, this exponential increase in tumor volume as a function of time. If you look at the endosanin grain, this is with PEG and the photodynamic therapy, and we do one dose of near infrared at a 12.6 um, 12 joules per centimeter squared uh, to, to where the breast cancer is on day one, and we just let the, the cancers grow or not grow. And in both cases, this was truncated because this is a very virulent form of cancer to the mouse, and um, the mortality of the controls, uh, most animals died by day 13. So we had to suspend this at day 12, but we were able to take this out to day 46, and you can clearly see we're, we're knocking it down uh, significantly. Most of these kinds of animal studies, you'll, you'll get uh, uh, an effective chemotherapeutic like docotaxel will, will be up here. Almost uh, a bit of overlap between the controls and the docotaxel, which is why two chemotherapeutics are used in every protocol I'm aware of. Okay, so to summar summarize, mesoscale instruments based on nano building elements will promote mentally invasive surgery and novel surgical approaches. One of the things we're working on right now is pancreatic cancer is really egregious cancer. And it often uses the portal vein as a scaffold to grow up and out of the um, pancreas. No surgeon will touch that with current surgical resolution. That simply you have you know six weeks or eight weeks to live and we can provide pain medication as the, the outcome. And 91% of pancreatic cancer cases are already metastatic on first diagnosis. Uh, and we aim to get to the point where the surgeon can take out one cell at a time. That's our goal, and manipulate at the cellular level. Bioimaging and drug delivery are just two of the areas where nanoparticulates offer great benefit. And we've encapsulated a number of drugs today. Doxorubicin, which is also used for breast cancer, docotaxel, 5-fluorouracil, I was on that one, uh, various RNAs and molecular medicine approaches. Cancers have been targeted and pint performed photo, immuno, nanotherapy, and breast, pancreatic, lung, AML, and others. So we can do better. We can all do better. And hopefully some of you will be interested in looking at this area and, and making some contributions. Like Feynman said, and I'm no Feynman, uh, it's the little things that often provide uh, the enabling technology. Being able to disperse nanoparticles opens up a very vast array of uh, emerging applications. And that's it. Thank you. have any questions uh, to Dr. Adair, please. Uh, we're going to open questions uh, now. For yes, sir. That's a, that's a nice question. You, you mean in, a, in an animal or a human, or do you mean just sitting around? Uh, we've, we've actually been utilizing about a 15 nanometer gold particle made by Ray Check, one of our professors in chemistry, to, to make some interesting shapes. I'm not going to say surgical instruments, because gold doesn't have the right material properties for too ductile for a surgical instrument. 
but it could be used for a variety of other things. So we've been making spin bars and gear type shapes. And the interesting that you ask that, we do all, all of our processing at room temperature. When we cast these particles <coughs> into, say, a, a bin bar uh, mold, and we use a bin bar because it's got very precise geometry and we can look for defects very easily, the gold shrinks by 27 volume percent over the course of three or four hours. Now that suggests that the gold itself at room temperature is centering. And, and we believe that that's the case. We haven't dug into the, some of the weeds with that. We're gonna have to section the parts and do TEM to actually see the microstructure. But there are, I know for a fact that if I, if I make copper uh, nanoplatelets that are on the order of three to five nanometers thick and maybe 30 nanometers across a face, I can cake cast those, laminate them, and hot press them at 200 degrees C under nitrogen, and I get, I get a penny. But I have to, I can't just let the, go, let them go into the dye. They've got to be oriented. So nanometals uh, permit very low temperature processing. What we really think of as the bench top type of processing to make fairly dense materials. So the answer is yes. We think gold even at room temperature. You bring the particles close enough, we'll start to thin it. Let's talk a little more, more about the biofuel. Uh, well, we use. Well, we use it. Uh, you're talking about the, the surgical instruments right. and the other parts. So, when Nick Antolino started working with me back in, I guess it was probably 2006. Um, we're on a mission to create basically a new manufacturing process. We knew none of the conventional processing was going to work. So we went through a logic tree to look at what was available. And what we wound up uh, developing was this idea of photolithographic mold. So, the, but we had a lot to overcome because they're, they're not, you know, what's done with, with photolithographic uh, patterning on a silicon chip is quite a bit different if you start with a high aluminum oxide substrate. For one thing, the aluminum oxide is highly reflective. So uh, in the first uh, mold we started to make, because of the reflectivity in the UV rain for curing the mold, we got, Nick called it a swimming pool effect. We got rounded edges. So we had to go to a barley 90 an anti-reflective coating subcoating to prevent that. Then in the, the, the next iteration, we're make, trying to make bend bars. Well, the tungsten filament used at Penn State in the nano fab lab has a, an emission, a very strong emission at 360 degree, 360 nanometer, where it, the SU8 absorbs. So we got trapezoidal shaped bend bars. Now we didn't see this even under FEM. We started testing and we noticed that if they were flipped one way, we got a different strength because we're really confounding the basic fracture mechanics equation. So, so we put, we, we cast an SU8 film and used that as a filter to prevent that cross-linking in the top surface. We get, got nice rectangular bars. When we started squeegeeing into the mold cavities, we found very early when we looked at cross sections, we had what Nick called dishing, right? Because the squeegee is fairly soft and it, even at 15 microns, it dips down and scoops out some of the material. I should have thought of that. I should have, I, I should have been able to say, oh, let's, the next problem will be, but I wasn't through science, I, I didn't. And, and so we, we, as we came across each manufacturing problem, we, we fixed it. To eliminate the dishing, we did what's usually done with tape cast, multi-layer capacitors, we planarized. So we left an overburden, let the uh, material cure, uh, and let the binder cross-link, and then we buffed off the top surface, and we got very smooth top surfaces that way. And so that, that was kind of the three iterations or four iterations. Oh, I'm a cheap guy, so I started with glass bonded alumina as our substrate, well, these parts are so small and zirconia is so sensitive to silica 
that where the, these little bend bars crossed the grain boundary, where they were exposed to the glass, some of the silicate wicked up into the zirconia. We got a transfer net grain growth, and the bars were C-shaped. So we had to solve that as well. So we, went, we took an engineering approach. And I've had a great time. I mean, most of my stuff has dealt with kind of basic science. So this is going right back to the kind of roots that I, uh, and the skill set I used to propel it as manufacturing. So we had a lot of little farms. <coughs> These are documented in our general American grant study table. Yes, ma'am. Question about who are you talking about? The ratio that you did, or how many farms? What, what was that? That's aspect ratio. So if I'm trying to make a freestanding ceramic part, and again, if you said, I want you to make me a ceramic fishing pole, I could do it. I could extrude it. It'd be a different process, but I could extrude it. But making high aspect ratio freestanding small parts is very difficult. Um, and actually, the photolithographic process by, had been looked at by Ludwig Dockler and his crew at the Swift Institute of, of Technology in Zurich, and, and the best they got was an aspect ratio of two. But we had very good dispersion and very, very good particle packing, so our shrinkage was under control. Here. That, that's done for just about every particulate material that we have to work with. So we've, we've even done it for uh, uh, MRI contrast agents, uh, barium sulfate. Barium sulfate uh, is usually agglomerated with one manufacturer, one is finer particles. Barium sulfate has very flat solubility and Promote the stress growth and cracking. It's been used for aluminum oxide, zirconia, as you saw, barium titanate, mostly metal oxides. We have I have really looked at semiconductor based materials at this point. Okay, uh, I think. Okay, we have a uh, one more question before we start the the workshop. Yes, sir. That, that's a very good question, um, and, and that's something that we've looked at. Uh, endo, and I can give you some basic theory. Endosan and green is uh, used as a drug. It's, it's used to look at <coughs> retinopathy in the back of the eyeball by ophthalmologists. So they'll inject it into the eye, and it, and it can clearly show the patterning of uh, blood vessel rupture in patients usually diabetic patients that have retinopathy. The, that, that drug sells for uh, 250 bucks a dose. Um, with our nanoparticles, you can use much less. And because one of the things that we see with endosan and green or any of, most of the fluorophores, if we encapsulate, the quantum efficiency of fluorescence goes up from twofold to some that have gone as high as tenfold. So we can use less material. The, the basic cost of the calcium phosphate uh, is, is minimal. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we use uh, reagent grade chemicals and then certify them for medical use. The actual process is a little embarrassing. I wish I could tell you it takes weeks and uh, I'm absolutely essential to it. Well, at this point, I'm more or less irrelevant to it. It takes like two hours. So, so because we figured out how to manipulate the stated dispersion, it, it, it's a fairly straightforward <coughs> routine protocol now. So, so the market was very good. I'll put it that way. An MRI contrast agent uh, costs on the order of about 1800 bucks a dose for iron oxide. Uh, our manufacturing costs are one hundredth of that. So I, th I think there's a, a nice market for this. But you work with gold, maybe not so much. You work with uh, semiconductors, 
that might be expensive to make it. So certainly quantum dots are not taking off the way we thought they would commercially. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you will be around here for the day, for the, the morning. Huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, if you have any old question you want to talk to Dr. Adair, he, he will be around the, uh, the hallways uh, in the morning. Yeah, probably. I'll be lurking. <laughs> so you, you, you can. Uh, 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 I, I know uh, Dr. Adair, when the first time I went to one of your uh, uh, keynotes, uh, you were assaulted after you finished with so many people, you know. <laughs> so uh, we, we, let us give a, a, a big applause to Dr. Adair. Okay? Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yeah, uh, now, b before we start the workshops, I, I would like to take uh, the five minutes or less of your time uh, uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, David Hatta. David Hatta is our evaluator. He's the person who uh, looks uh, after what we do here and uh, in order for to, to ensure that the money that we receive from National Science Foundation is uh, well uh, spent. And, and uh, David will tell us uh, about the surveys, about the, uh, about the evaluation that uh, he has to make, okay? Thank you, Abe. Uh, just a few comments. Uh, the evaluation is an important part of, of the ATE grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, if you haven't turned in your uh, participant survey, please do that. Uh, for each workshop, there will be a survey. I'm asking you to put your name on it because I want you to tell me your story about the value you get from the conference today and tomorrow. And I need to correlate uh, your workshop surveys with your participant survey. After the conference, you will get an email survey that will ask you about the overall conference. We're not doing that pencil and paper uh, at the conference, but you will get it and it will come from Abe. Then, that, that will measure immediate value that you get from the conference and the potential value, what you plan to do. But we also need to know what you actually do. So during spring semester, at the end of spring semester this year, again, fall semester and spring semester of next year, you will get a email query from me asking you, did you apply, how did you apply the material that you gained, the how did you apply the skills that you gained through this conference? And that will measure applied value. And that's what I'm interested, what immediate value you get, what potential value did this conference generate, and what applied value happens after the conference. So I urge you, spend, fill out those, those workshop surveys and turn them in and give some thought to, to your responses. I tried to keep them as short as possible so that you aren't overburdened. But that information is important to Neotech, and it's my job to tell Neotech's story, and that's the data that I will use to do that. So thank you very much for your cooperation and your help in, uh, pr in uh, gathering this information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now, uh, uh, we're going to start the, the workshops, and um, each one of you have a, an assigned workshop today and tomorrow. Uh, you can look at the uh, rooms of the workshops in the back of your brochure, okay? The rooms are, all, all the workshops are in this building, in BTC, and uh, you, you may look at that, okay? Thank you very much.